Brian Seitel is Senior Managing Director and partner of the Bonson Group and joins us now live uh, from sunny California. Brian, a very good afternoon, your side, and thank you for joining us. If we can start with uh, the performance in the U.S. markets uh, rallying to record highs and then uh, maybe a little bit of profit taking, or was it uh, the uh, spike in treasuries that spooked the market? I think it's a combination of those things. I mean, the volatility index, the VIX, is is upward uh, upwards of 20 at this point, and so you just have more volatility. Part of that is around the upcoming election. Earnings are just now getting into gear. They're going to really start to kick in this week. Um, I suspect they'll be pretty good, and so you may get some support in markets. But when you get Treasury yields up, call it 45 basis points on the 10-year or 50 basis points over the course of, the, of a month, you know, that's starting to get the attention of markets here a little bit, and it, it causes the valuation of where things are now to look a little more expensive um, uh, than it already does. We got 114 S&P companies reporting this week. Uh, are there any on your radar that you want to particularly look out for? Well, you know, some of the names that we own, you know, we're, we're value investors, we're dividend growth investors. Um, and so, you know, co uh, companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, we own some of the staple names like Kenview. There was some news out today about an activist hedge fund named Starboard taking a, a large sizable position in that particular name. So that is definitely on our radar. Um, uh, for what we're looking at from a dividend growth perspective, um, we think there's a lot of value in that particular name. This was the spinoff, if you recall, from uh, Johnson & Johnson. It was their uh, uh, health and consumer goods uh, company uh, that spun off. Uh, so things like that. And, and some of the other healthcare names, too. We've got a few weeks from now, we'll have Amgen and Gilead. Those are names that we, we own in the portfolio as well. Uh, some of the mega caps like Tesla also in focus are reporting on Wednesday and there has been some expectation that they could be reporting an annual sales decline. Uh, is there anything that you're looking out for from Elon Musk and uh, potentially maybe more details on the robo taxi? You know, Tesla is not a name that we own. It's outside of, of what, you know, what our mandate is and what we're trying to accomplish for clients. Again, it's, it's an income story. It's a growth of income. Tesla is far from paying a dividend of any sizable amount. Um, so as far as, you know, earnings coming out and, and what they may or may not say about uh, the robo tax, that would be interesting. It doesn't gonna affect really what we're doing, what we're looking at the market. We're trying to really stay away from some of the higher valuation, some of those technology names that have just gotten so expensive here. Um, you know, these companies trading at 40 and 50 times earnings and trying to stay in that high single digit, you know, high teens type of multiple um, arena with some income yield along with it. Some more of the defensive names here, too, as interest rates start to come down. Uh, we're cognizant of, of just, you know, what part of the market has led up to this point and caused valuations to get to where they are. Tesla is one of those. NVIDIA, you were, you were speaking about on the prior segment, is one of those. Um, I think going forward, Playing a much more value-oriented approach and keeping valuations in mind is just going to be paramount, frankly. The financials like J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley are within your portfolio. Why do you like financials? You know, interest rates coming back down, you've got a steepening yield curve, albeit uh, slowly steepening, um, but it is good for net interest margins. Um, if you think about investment banking activity basically being dormant for you know, from since 2021, uh, now picking back up, uh, both Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan in both of their numbers. Uh, J.P. Morgan had a 31 percent increase in IB fees, investment banking fees year over year. Um, so those types of things on top of just being a highly well-run institution with a very attractive dividend yield trading at, you know, 15, 16 times earnings forward. Those are attractive names that we like. Morgan Stanley is a different story. You know, that, that is more of a dividend play. There's a new CEO there, Ted Pick. He's very committed to the dividend. We love that about it. They have a very durable business now with wealth management. It's a very steady annuitized res, uh, revenue stream um, that is growing. They have a goal of bringing that up to $10 trillion from six where it is now. And so having sort of this rising cash flow machine able to return to our shareholders in the form of rising dividends is really attractive to us. And we're back with Brian Seitel of the Bonson Group. Brian, let's first continue our discussion here as we just heard about crypto. Uh, we've seen upside, of course, uh, with the support or maybe the expectation that uh, Trump can see a 2.0 in the White House. Uh, do you own crypto and what do you think of it? 
So we, we do not own crypto. Uh, and again, what we're doing is managing more on, on an income base. And of course, crypto is, has nothing to do with an income uh, source whatsoever. Um, so no, it's not something that we own. Um, as far as it trading higher because of, of you know polling showing Trump maybe advancing a little bit here, um, it's interesting because uh, growth is advancing. If that's if that's the thesis, interest rates have gone up, and usually you've seen both Nasdaq and also crypto, which are very highly correlated, um, come down with some higher interest rates. So you know, call that for what it is. I think it's a volatile asset class. I think it serves a function. I think it's fascinating. It's not something that we're putting uh, client capital in, into now. In terms of the election outcome and the impact of the markets and how they trade, uh, you're saying that the outcome for Congress will be more important for markets. Can you talk us through that? Well, I mean, historically, look, I, for, for listeners, every election is different. Uh, no, I don't <laughs> wish I knew who the outcome, what the outcome would be. I do not, uh, of course. But I frankly don't think that anyone does with how close it is. And I think markets pricing in which one over the other I think is a little bit stretched as far as assuming that's what's happening uh, at this point. It's a very, very close election. But what we do know historically is that one, here's the good news, um, you know, 78% of the time over a four year term, the market is higher, regardless of whether it's a Republican or Democrat. So I'll put some, some listeners at ease. The, uh, the other thing is that when you have gridlock, meaning, you know, a Republican or Democratic uh, a summon to the White House and then, you know, a split Congress, which is most likely what's going to be the case this time, regardless of whether it's Harris or Trump that gets in, then that's actually fairly market friendly. So we can talk about different sectors and how they may um, rally or, or, or sell off based on which one will ultimately win the White House. But um, it's, it's just I can give you periods of time where the intuitive um, sector to do well under one president did the opposite and vice versa. You know, we can look at energy, for example. We know that Trump will be uh, deregulatory and, and probably more pro-energy than a Harris would. And so that would make me think that more supply equals lower prices and maybe a weaker energy market, just like in his first term. But then he also had energy under the Obama administration um, also had a terrible uh, time with, with a whole lot of regulation around shale and, and fracking and these types of things. So my point is just other parts of the market are going to move things more than really who sits in the White House for four years. That's our take on it. And I'm saying that with the luxury of somewhat assuming we're going to have a divided Congress. And what about the tariffs? So there has been a threat now from Trump that uh, he could put 150 or 200 percent tariffs on China if they go into Taiwan. How do you view China from this regard? Well, you know, our investment in China is fairly limited, frankly. And so, you know, the, it's, you know there's two different topics there. If we're talking about tariffs, um, generally speaking, I believe that uh, they can be useful uh, in moderation for unique situations. And we've had them for 100 years. So, th so they're not anything new. Um, as far as them being 200 percent on a certain industry or, or, or country, um, will that matter? Of course it will. Do I think if it is highly market unfriendly? I mean that if it starts to destabilize um, things, do I think it'll be lasting? Um, I don't. Okay, so I think that markets will drive some of of, uh, of where these things um, shake out. All that said, Trump's tariffs from the 2016 era when he was president are all still in place. So the Biden administration kept them. In fact, they have now started to increase them uh, above that too. So I I don't know if I'm as worried about Trump winning the White House. And using tariffs probably more of as a negotiation factor and whether they end up staying the same or get slightly increased, time will tell. But no, that's not something I think traders or investors, I should say, should really try to position their portfolio around now. There's too many unknowns there. We got about 30 seconds left, but I want to ask uh, with the stimulus that we've been hearing out from China, would this give you to increase your exposure? As far as look, the market going up 20 percent in a few weeks is something to see. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal when you really think about it. Um, and uh, there's great businesses there. And that's that's not at all uh, what I would say. I think, generally speaking, um, investing in the emerging market consumer, whether it be in China or in India or Brazil or these countries that have very large growing populations from a demographic perspective that are coming out out of you know, poverty and into middle class is very, very investable. And, and we have a sizable position mm -hmm. there. Um, China happens to be an underweight, mostly around uh, the unknown of what CCP may or may not do.